Japan's car industry has been the giant killer. The cars they're testing are what the rest of the world now has to beat. They come from behind to make nine million cars a year, more than any other country. As they overtook the world, they rewrote the basic lessons of mass production. This is the story of the Japanese industry which made the greatest dent in Western manufacturing pride. Japan had been late to enter the automobile age. In the 1920s, there were only a few thousand cars in the country. Almost all were imported from abroad. For the Japanese, driving cars was one thing, making them another. They hadn't the production know-how or the engineering base to build them economically. With a huge potential market ripe for the picking, Japan now experienced a total foreign takeover. American businessmen moved in quickly. With their unmatched experience, General Motors and Ford set up large modern factories. Parts were shipped over from Detroit. American managers taught their Japanese workers the American way. Soon, these transplant factories were producing 90% of Japan's vehicles. But the Japanese government was alarmed. They didn't like the drain of cash out of the country. In 1930, the Ministry of Commerce warned, the fact that we depend on imports is unbearable from the point of view of national defense to say nothing of the balance of trade. Japanese industrialists were urged to make cars themselves. Toyota, who made textile looms, built their first cars in 1934. For their first small car, Nissan bought second-hand machine tools from the United States and hired American engineers. There was a specialist in casting in the foundry. He came from abroad. And in the forge, there was a foreign supervisor. And it was the same in the pressing shop. To put it bluntly, foreigners were our teachers. By now, Japan was under military government and pursuing a war in China. The soldiers wanted to bring the motor industry under their own control. They expelled Ford and General Motors and built up Nissan and Toyota as principal suppliers for the Imperial Army. In the Second World War, trucks were all that mattered. Car production stopped altogether as Japan attacked the Western Allies. Despite the propaganda, the trucks were unreliable and crude. The demand for military vehicles laid the foundation for Japan's motor industry. But the great adventure ended in surrender. Japan was defeated and the workers and managers had no idea what to expect. Eiji Toyoda had joined his family's firm in 1937. The war had just finished. Everyone was wondering what would happen now. What would happen to Japan? What would happen to our own daily lives and to our country? No one knew what to expect. We were all in a kind of limbo. The economy was in chaos. Japan was cut off from its raw materials. All the military orders had stopped. The black market flourished. During the war, Mr. Honda's small company had made aero engine parts. 
Unless you went out looking for them, parts and materials were impossible to get hold of. So that was my wife's job. My job was to stay at home boozing. And unless you went a long way, you wouldn't find what you were looking for. And it was hard cycling all that way. Anyway, there was a small 50cc engine that the army had used in the war, so I got hold of one and fixed it onto a bicycle, and with that you could bomb a lot. And that was the first motor-powered bicycle to be made after the war. Three-wheeled bicycles and motorcycles, sturdy little vehicles which carry a load all out of proportion to their size, today perform a very large part of the freight hauling. This is the Nipponese version of the Stanley steamer. When the operator starts the fire, you never know whether it's going to burn up, blow up, or just behave itself. GI drivers in Japan usually give this number a wide berth when passing on the street. The technical superiority of the Americans who were now occupying Japan had never seemed clearer. But the men who built the army's trucks wanted to put the war behind them quickly and get back to business. Toyota's factories had survived the bombing. Mr. Ono was one of their engineers. It was only two or three days after our defeat in the war. The company president, Kiichiro Toyoda, gathered us all together and he made a speech. He said, you've got three years to catch up with American industry. If you don't, the motor industry in Japan will be finished. Well, I wondered if Kiichiro had realized that American manufacturers' productivity was at least eight times better than our own. Then I thought to myself, although catching up with the Americans in three years was out of the question, at least we ought to set about it in that sort of spirit. To most, catching up seemed a distant dream. At that time, I was living in the single men's dormitory, and the chimneys of the company's forge were just across from my window. So when I looked out and saw smoke coming out of them, I'd think, oh great, that means they've got some coal. When there was nothing, I knew there'd be no vehicles made that day, even if I turned up for work. So on those days, we would go to the local farmers and try to swap things that we'd made for food. Companies struggled on, but with too many workers and too few orders, they were near to bankruptcy. One day I heard a news flash on the radio that war had broken out in Korea. And when I went to the factory, I discovered that we'd got an order for 3,000 army trucks. And suddenly we were hard at work. It was funny because until that week, we'd all been laid off. The president of Toyota wrote, the orders were Toyota's salvation. I felt a mingling of joy for my company and a sense of guilt that I was rejoicing at another country's war. As Japan regained independence in 1952, its motor factories still concentrated on trucks. It nearly stayed that way. When the companies wanted to move into cars, they were opposed by the governor of the Bank of Japan, Mr. Ichimada, who said, efforts to foster a car industry in Japan are meaningless. Since America can produce cheap, high-quality cars, shouldn't we depend on them for our cars? But the case for making them was put as strongly by others. At that time, I was the official in the Ministry of International Trade and Industry responsible for the motor industry. I said that if we were to plan for the post-war recovery of the economy so that everyone in Japan could make a living, we needed major industries. In particular, we needed to build up an automobile industry. 
because car manufacture has many other industries associated with it, and we had to provide jobs for a lot of people. It would also help raise the general level of technology in factories. For all those reasons, we had to bring on car making as a strategic industry. In Miti, we clung very firmly to this thinking. The powerful Ministry of Trade and Industry, Miti, was now backing them, but there was a long way to go. Using the chassis from light trucks, they bolted on bodies to make Japan's first post-war passenger cars. With their truck origins, they were sturdy but crude. As they started to develop better models, the firms had to set up new car design teams in the factories. At Nissan, one of the car pioneers was Mr. Tanabe. I was in Nissan's design department at Tsurumi. It was in an old building made of wood two stories high, and the floor was pretty rotten. When we were doing experiments and that sort of thing, we'd bring engine parts like cylinder blocks upstairs and put them beside our desks. But we were told that if everybody did this, the floor would give way. So after that, we were forbidden to bring heavy objects upstairs. Or if we did, we had to keep them near the corners. At the time, half the cars were imported. So heavy tariffs, up to 40%, were imposed to keep them out. But for their own industry, they needed know-how. And Ford, expelled before the war, was still the model. In Detroit, Henry Ford had built the biggest car plant in the world. His mass production methods set the standards others had to follow. Detroit in the 50s was king of the mountain. The world couldn't do what they did. Uh, the world came to their door. It how to make automobiles in high volume. And it was a simple automobile, highly refined for simplicity's sake, low cost of high volume manufacture. One of the first Japanese to visit Ford's Detroit factory was A.G. Toyoda. They told me that because Ford was such a huge company, there were actually only a few people who could answer all the questions in the various areas we had raised. And they said, why are you being so greedy? Why are you making so many requests? So I said, I understand. But because Toyota is such a little company, we managers have to be involved in all the manufacturing areas. So please help me. Toyota was allowed to spend three months inspecting the plants. He wrote home to his company newspaper, throughout assembly everything is tested again and again. I realize this is the way to produce perfect cars. There's much for Toyota to learn here. Our first measure was to encourage the introduction of technology from the developed countries, Europe and America. We tried to get all manufacturers to form technology tie-ups with foreign companies, but on the understanding that they move toward 90% domestic manufacture within five years. The British taught the Japanese how to make cars too. When Nissan needed help, they signed an agreement with Austin. Years of research, experiment and trials went into this car before the Austin designers were satisfied. Now manufactured with scrupulous skill from the finest possible materials and tested at every point, the Cambridge will soon be ready to leave the lines under its own power. At first, Austin shipped all the parts from Britain. But the government wanted Nissan to make each component, and finally the whole car, in Japan as soon as possible. Before this could be done, they had to meet British standards. 
できたものをまあ全部日産で検査しまして。Each time we made a new part for ourselves at Nissan, it would be flown to Austin in England. There it would be inspected and okayed for manufacture by us. Eric Holbeach was sent from Birmingham to Yokohama to supervise production of the Austin design. Their equipment was, was very basic.、Um, And、uh, it included a lot of machines, which were Japanese copies of, of British and American and German machines, which they had produced themselves,、um, no doubt, because of the difficulty of importing machine tools at that time. As they studied the blueprints, Holbeach found the Japanese engineers eager to learn and persistent. If you couldn't give them a precise answer for any reason, then they would repeat the question. If they still didn't get an answer, then it would be left on one side.、Uh, sure enough, the following day or the day after, they would come up with the same question again. And we rather got the feeling that they thought we were hiding something from them. And then they would come out, Mr. Holbeach, we must learn from the West. Please, can you answer this question? With Holbeach's help, the first Japanese A40 came off the line in 1953. Austin's home factory was then one of the most modern in Europe, and Japanese engineers like Mr. Suzaki were sent to see it. I saw how the parts came from the foundry and were moved onto the machine shop by overhead surveyor. It was all automatic. It was the first time I had seen anything like that, and I thought it was amazing. But come ten o'clock, they all had a tea break, and everyone had their own mug, which they'd go and fill from an urn, and then they'd rest for ten minutes. Just wonder about the factory. And that meant production had to stop for ten minutes as well. Osaka で開かれた展示会ではどの車も大変な評判 Other firms made similar tie-ups with Renault, Hillman, and other European companies. But the biggest Japanese firm, Toyota, was determined to go it alone and develop a modern, all Japanese popular car. Their first model was called the Toyo Pet. We collected together lots of parts from Ford, Austin, Chevrolet, and Hillman, and so on, and had a close look at them all. That's how we started off. The machine tools, the boring machines, and so on, were all old from before the war, and they were pretty worn out. I worked on them to get them something like automated to raise productivity. We had to do all the designing ourselves and then do all the work by hand. In the mid 1950s, the protected Japanese car makers were learning fast, but their technology was way behind the rest of the world. When Nissan produced their first home designed Datsun model, They wanted to test it against the foreign competition, so in 1958 they entered it in the Round Australia Rally. Ah,、uh, you men, Nabushi. I thought we might get a bit of publicity, but even if we didn't, we'd be none the worse for it, because having the chance to test the car in those conditions would be very useful. ダットさんはフロントのフェンダーを傷つけましたが丈夫なダットさんのボディは袖を叩き出すのにまた大骨を折らなければなりませんでした大きなハンマーで殴ってもびくともしない強いダットさんのボディに市民たちは青い目を見張ってびっくりしていました自分の車はどういう車かっていうのは人の車の車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は車は
That was our purpose in going, so the whole team were engineers. To Australian and even Japanese surprise, the Datsun won its class. You see, we'd been defeated in the war, and everything had looked bleak. So when a Japanese car with Japanese drivers did well in an international competition, it gave everyone a tremendous lift. The Japanese had now recovered from the war. They were still poor by Western standards. Most people could afford only motorbikes, but 11 companies were already making cars. Toyota trained women graduates for its sales force. We went on training course after training course. We even learned about servicing. When we took the demonstration cars out, we'd sometimes see our competitors from another company parked outside a house, and we'd know a salesman was in there. And when they in turn saw our cars parked, they knew that Toyota was in there trying to clinch a deal. You had to be very careful with these demonstration cars. I'd either have to get up very early in the morning or go in the evening when it was dark to throw our rivals off the scent. I'd park in alleyways so as not to be spotted. The cars they sold were expensive, and to make more sales, the companies had to get the prices down. The key to that was not just technology, but working practices and labor relations in the factories. Japanese labor relations weren't always the envy of the world. After the war, there was constant strife as new, industry-wide unions battled with managers. After wartime service in the Air Force, Mr. Mayaki went to work in a car plant. Nissan was the company that went 12 months on 10 months work because it was on strike at least two months a year. Production didn't go smoothly. Wages were paid late. It was a very unsettled place. Labor relations were so bad, I thought, well, I've joined a company that looks as though it's about to go broke. I was general secretary of the union, and I held frequent meetings with the shop stewards in order to pass on information. It was very hard to get enough to eat just on our wages. Everybody thought that we had to do something about it. The crucial showdown for the car industry came in 1953. The National Car Workers Union, the Zenji, took on the companies in a claim for wages and more shop floor control. Nissan refused to negotiate and locked out the strikers. Behind the barricades, Nissan's managers stayed in the factory. We camped out in the offices on the second floor of the administration block. We blocked the staircases with wood so that nobody could come up. There were lots of offices, and we spread blankets across the desks and slept there. We were in there for 45 days. The Nissan dispute became a symbolic fight, watched closely by other employers. The Nikiran, the Japanese Employers Association, gave us great support. They held meetings with us and advised us on anti-union tactics. Since this was the sort of strike that the management couldn't really cope with, the only course of action was to eliminate the union. That was the only way we were going to get anywhere. There was no alternative. The management plan was to outmaneuver the strike leaders by encouraging a new, more compliant company union, which would settle quickly. 
Masaru Mayaki became the leader of the Breakaway Union. Its slogan was, only those who love the company love the union. They put pressure on the strikers. They called on us at our homes and they said to us, if you hold out like this, there may be no job for you to come back to. You'll be sacked. That was the sort of intimidation there was. But, they said, if you come over to the new union, you won't have to repay the money that you've borrowed from the old union. After 14 weeks, the tactics succeeded. Mayaki led the workers who'd changed their allegiance back to work. We marched in a narrow column to make it look as if there were a lot of us. As we marched in, people from the first union picket started to come over in steadily increasing numbers. It was an extremely effective march. At the moment we entered the works, that was the end of the first union. The company had its victory. It was a turning point. The dispute stopped. The first union was disbanded. From then on, managers had cooperation and a new freedom to change working practices. At Toyota, the engineer who did most to push the pace was Taichi Ono. Machines actually work by themselves. So someone standing over one, watching it intently, might think he's working. <laughs> but the machine's doing fine on its own. So I'd say, that's a waste of manpower. If I found a job that was being done efficiently, I would say, try doing it with half the number of men. And after a time, when they had come back and said that they'd done that, I'd say, OK, half the number again. At night, I'd have dreams. My job was the last one on the line, and I'd dream that I wasn't keeping up. And just as the engine was about to fall off the end, I'd wake up with a shout. Things got to that stage. If I just called the foreman in and said stop the waste, people wouldn't understand what I meant. They'd say, but we've always done things that way. Or, this man's a hard worker. But I'd say, you can't see straight. That's not real work. So unless I spoke to the worker right on the shop floor, it was difficult to get things to change. With the introduction of the production line, the foreman's job changed. His role now was to see that the line ran smoothly. Before that, they'd felt that wasn't enough, that if they weren't getting their hands dirty, they weren't really working. But Mr. Ono would come along and say, your job is to stand here and make absolutely sure that the line is moving properly. I remember him drawing a chalk circle on the floor and saying, you stand in here. Ono was the most creative engineer in the post-war car industry. He made the maximum use of human labor, and he changed the whole system which fed the assembly line itself. In the traditional method, the many different parts, doors or engines, had been pushed out in big numbers and piled up beside the line until they were needed. This was Henry Ford's method. Yeah, if we'd done that in post-war Japan, especially in the motor industry, we would have gone bust straight away. Goods needed to be turned into money as quickly as possible. So we really had to keep our stocks to the bare minimum. Ono saw that by carrying one or two months' stock, 
Toyota were tying up immense amounts of capital. So they reorganized the factories until the assembly line and the making of the parts ran at the same rate. Parts were only made and pulled to the assembly line in the quantity that was needed. The Japanese called it the just-in-time method. With the just-in-time system, the most important thing was to produce only what was needed. When workers needed more parts, they themselves would go and get them. But if they took parts away without leaving anything in exchange, you would have a problem. So just as in a supermarket, where customers take goods from the shelves and exchange them for money, we used what we call a Kanban instead of money. At each workstation, the Kanban acted as a sort of order form. The Kanban said in effect, this number of these parts has been used, so please make this number of the same parts and place them here. If Mr. Erno found a stack of doors or bumpers, 10 or 12 that had been made and left on one side, he'd kick it as he walked past, crash. He'd kick it and say, don't make waste like this. Just you stick to making only what's needed when it's needed. The Americans used their huge presses to stamp out the same parts for weeks at a time. The Japanese made fewer vehicles but a range of models. So they had to use the same presses to make parts for different cars. I wanted the machines to produce sets of a hundred of one shape and then change to another. Although the production may have only taken minutes, changing the machines could take hours and everyone would be standing around doing nothing, wasting time. Erno got the time for changing the dies in the presses, which took up to three hours in America, down to a few minutes. Then the same machine that had just been pressing mud guards could get on with other parts. The Ono revolution to get the best use of labor and machines was extended to all the suppliers. Productivity increased fourfold in 10 years. But the factories were old. What was needed was investment. So help came again from Miti. We talked to the Japan Development Bank, or the Small and Medium Enterprise Bank, in order to arrange cheap loans for companies. That was the system we set up. Fortunately, a lot of people came forward who were very positive about wanting to reinvest, and we used our good offices to help them. The finance scheme was originally set up to run for five years, but it was extended to run to ten years. In that time, the ministry was able to arrange about 64 billion yen in loans for investment purposes, which was an enormous sum in those days. The car firms planned new plants that would be as modern as any in the world. Toyota built the first, Motomachi, in 1959. We got a loan from the World Bank. I think it was about a billion yen, and I was told, OK, you get half, get on with it. I wasn't even a section leader at the time. So I said, how do I go about it? And they said, that's for you to work out. <laughs> It was a fairly spectacular investment, and if everything worked out successfully, it would prove very good for Toyota's future. But if it were to fall on stony ground, then we'd be faced with a real disaster. Up until then, among the people I worked with, if a new workman joined, within a few days or so, I'd have found out his name, of course, but also where he was from, whether his parents were alive, whether or not he had brothers and sisters. But when the new production facilities came in, all that disappeared. As the new factories were opened, the output of cars grew by up to 80% a year. Japan's economy was roaring into high growth and the car makers were leading the way. 
どんな過酷なテストにも耐えるコロナ1500強靭な足回り堅牢なボディ強くたくましいトヨペットコロナ1500デラックス今年の新規採用で補うことができなかった人手不足を少しでも会社では人手不足を受けて入れてすでにあの荷物は来ておるんですけど渡しておりますからね部長自ら人頭指揮を取り業務部員が総出で貴重な新しい社員のためにサービスに努めるコンパニーは、ハウジングを受けて、ウォーク・フォーズ・ライフ・タイム・エンプロイメント。スクール・リーバーズは、トレインコンパニー・スクールズ・アン・インベスメント・フォー・フューチャーズ。サイズ・グルー、モーン・モー・ファミリーズ・ビケム・ドゥ・ドゥ・ドゥ・ドゥ・ There were still 103 people for each car in Japan, compared with three in America. The stage in a nation's development known as motorization was now underway. In 1960 alone, three million Japanese took to the road for the first time at driving schools. But the Japanese car market, growing so fast, was closed to the rest of the world's manufacturers and was a private preserve. Western cars were still ahead technically, but were out of reach. They could be admired at motor shows, but tariffs and other restrictions made sure they remained exotic and inaccessible. Seen from abroad, it may have looked as if we were being excessively defensive, for all I know. But it was caused by the feeling that we still had a very long way to go. There was a plus and a minus side to such heavy government involvement. Not all firms liked the guidance they were being given by the bureaucrats. Mr. Honda, who had become the leading motorcycle manufacturer, wanted to start making cars as well. But Miti tried to stop him. The bureaucrats still had their heads full of the old notions of central control. They were absolutely no help. You wouldn't believe what a hard time I had with Miti. When I wanted to make cars, they said, keep out. Toyota and Nissan are doing it already. I said, I'm free to do what I want. The war's over, you know. Belt conveyor, in the case of the world, there are 14.1% of the cars are built. 去年は生産台数228万台世界第3位であった今年はさらに昨年の 25% 増の需要が見込まれついに西ドイツを抜いてアメリカに次ぎ世界第2の自動車生産国にのし上がることになるだろう。In the 1960s, as their efficiency improved and manufacturing costs came down to world levels, the Japanese firms looked overseas for new markets. But the export story had started inauspiciously back in 1957, when Toyota shipped their first cars to California. I said the car wasn't ready for America, and I didn't want them to sell it there. But Mr. Kamiya, who was head of Toyota sales, said, one day we'll have to do business in America, because the market there is so enormous. 
He said, you may not agree with me, but we need to sell some cars there just to establish a bridgehead. It was a piece of junk. It was it didn't start in cold weather very well. We didn't do a lot with it. We just had it around the test fleet. And I can remember going over and looking at it and, and thinking it was a joke. It was badly made, uh, underpowered, terribly underpowered for American expressways. Nissan sent a group of engineers to California to see how their small Datsun cars would stand up to the American climate and tougher driving conditions. Mr. Tanabe was one of the testers. Speeds were much faster. Where in Japan it was usual to travel at 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, they were driving at 50 to 60 miles per hour, so they were going nearly twice as fast. The first Toyotas were a sales disaster. It had trouble getting onto the freeways in Los Angeles. Because the acceleration was poor, it couldn't get into the flow of traffic. There were a number of problems of this sort. Anyway, we couldn't sell the cars we'd sent over there, which in a way isn't surprising because you can't sell a car that can't be driven. The Japanese kept on trying. The target was not so much American cars themselves as European imports like Volkswagen. Nissan sent Mr. Katayama to study their success. After much observation, I discovered that Volkswagen's secret was their after-sales service. They supplied a lot of spare parts and trained people in after-sales service. In this respect, they were much better than any of the American companies. Katayama and his team struggled to sell the cars and provide proper service. Since we didn't have a supply of spares, I was forced to remove parts from other cars we had to service the ones that had broken down. As this went on, our company cars were gradually being stripped of more and more of their parts, until in some cases we were left with just an empty shell. He hired a local advertising agency to win over the American public. When a man discovers he's stolen something, he does the obvious. He gets out of town. This getaway car is the new Datsun 410 sedan. Standard equipment includes white sidewall tires and the interior. How's this for steel? Up front, a soft padded dash. Heater defroster, seat belts and contour seats. In the back, all vinyl upholstery. Wall to wall carpeting. And yes, even an ashtray. All standard. All yours for one low price. By the late 1960s, American car companies at last began to take notice. This is an easy story to tell. All you have to do is count. It starts back in the 50s on the road. Count the foreign cars in this picture. Go ahead. We'll wait. Now add 20 years. Things have changed. This is the 1970s. Some people call them the Japanese Beatles. Their real names, Toyota and Datsun. By now, the Japanese had overcome the early quality problems and were making their mark, especially in California. We saw, when we went out there for sales meeting, all these little nippers' cars running up and down the streets, and they had 15% of the marketplace or some such number. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? In 1973, the world economy was hit by the oil crisis. Petrol prices rose four times over. All car firms suffered, including the Japanese. When one company faced bankruptcy, the Japanese response was to take workers off the assembly line and send them out to sell the cars door to door. 
やはり一軒一軒家庭訪問するときにですね When I went to the houses, I found it very hard to deal with housewives face to face. I'd give up very easily. It went on like that for quite a while. I didn't have much courage, you see. But really, there was nothing for it but to go out and try to sell the cars because the company was facing a crisis and we had no work to do here. We were worried about the situation and, well, we had to make a living. But in America, the oil shock gave the Japanese an unexpected bonus. The United States government put out figures which showed the Japanese Datsun had the best fuel economy of any model on sale. This is one of our most valuable resources, a gallon of gasoline. It must not be wasted. Well, the advertising manager came up with the slogan, Datsun Saves. He got the idea from Jesus Saves. I said, well, that puts me in a bit of a spot. I'm not too sure about using that in an advertising campaign. You'll squeeze every mile out of every precious drop. In fact, we sold a six months backlog of stocks in two months, and the orders continued to flood in. They were saying, send us cars, however much they cost, and we were really kept on our toes. Suddenly, what they sold uh, was hot. And suddenly, what Detroit sold was not, and that was a, a big, uh, big break, if you will, for the Japanese. They just happened to be at the right place at the right time, where fuel was concerned. While American gas guzzlers stood unsold, and the workers who built them were laid off, imports rose fast. It was a foreign car, but some unemployed Detroit area residents changed all that this afternoon. Frustration, bitterness, and most of all, anger. That's the mood in Detroit these days and it's chronicled every night on the local news. How do you feel now? Oh, it's a lot better. That did some good? Sure did. It's a lot better. How long have you been off work? Well, I got laid off on, uh, not even a month ago. You feel this had a lot to do with it, the foreign cars? Sure did. The Japanese tailored their cars for every export market. They'd been the first to introduce robots. They'd made breakthroughs in cleaner engines to meet anti-pollution requirements they'd improve quality. Now, it was the Americans and the Europeans who came to Japan to see how it had all been done. I would go back to Nagoya and I'd walk in those places and I can remember, and I'm sure you can't use this on a tape, I'd say, holy shit, look what's happening here. Nous savons effectivement que le Japon obtient, a obtenu et obtient des résultats très remarquables en la matière et nous sommes venus en particulier pour étudier la manière dont on procède dans le travail par petits groupes. You can see that this was a different world. Uh, the work pace was dramatically uh, more rapid than it was in the United States. Uh, people were uh, just working like dogs. Uh, and there was an eagerness and an effort that uh, I had never seen in my entire experience. The rest of the world began to learn about flexible production, the just-in-time system, 
quality control and Japanese labor relations. In the late 50s, if, if Toyota made 200,000 units of anything, it was surprising. Now it's two million. Big difference. By 1980, Japanese cars had 20% of the American market. The American companies faced huge losses and asked for protection. And so, to prevent the once proud American car industry from going completely down the drain, they actually asked our government if we would, in some way, limit our exports to the United States. I said to them that if you impose limits on competition, you won't help your industry to get strong again that way. If your intention is to make your industry competitive again, limits are the last thing you need. In the end, though, because of the political situation between the two countries, our government set up the voluntary restraint system. In fact, it's a compulsory voluntary restraint system. <laughs> the Japanese agreed not to ship more than 1.8 million cars a year to the United States. Europe set limits as well. So, to get round the import restrictions, they started making Japanese cars abroad. Toyota began at an old General Motors plant. They sent Japanese managers to retrain the American workers. <laughs> しかし、スタート直後から指導する日本人とアメリカ人労働者の間で様々な問題が起こった。Remember he gave the Japanese transplants grew fast. Within a few years, they'd opened 10 new factories in the United States. In Japan, the firms kept up the pressure for higher productivity. With a racially homogenous workforce, it's much easier to discuss things. In fact, it's perfectly natural for us to have a unanimous agreement in whatever we undertake. They've done a lot uh, to share with their people and to build participation with their people, but they've also driven their people, uh, uh, literally almost unmercifully, uh, not all, primarily in Japan, but even in this country. Uh, they're driving the people to uh, levels of worker pace uh, that one wonders if you can sustain over the long term. Nearly 60 years after Ford first showed the Japanese the American way of mass production, Ford badge cars are being made in Japan again. 
But now, it's a Japanese firm that designs and builds small models on Detroit's behalf. With factories on every continent, the Japanese now make 30% of the world's cars. They started late, they kept out imports, but with fierce competition at home, they transformed the old Detroit methods. Their efficiency became almost unstoppable. We had to start from scratch again after the war. That's what accounts for the strength of Japan's industry today. That's what I think, because that's what I'm like. I'm not afraid of anything. <laughs> Except the wife. <laughs> In Japan, we have an old saying, the last fart of the ferret. When a ferret is cornered and about to die, it will let out a terrible smell to repel its enemy and escape. Now that's real nous. And it's the same with human beings. When they're under so much pressure that they feel it's a matter of life or death, they will come up with all kinds of ingenuity. It may be an overstatement to say we went from being pupils to being teachers. But we've been running for all we're worth after our competitor. Recently we've drawn neck and neck and we may win or lose by a nose. Anyway, there are naturally things that we can still learn from others. And it has turned out that there are some things that others can learn from us.